plus their breath on the other side. Yes, dude, they know you're not safe. It's truly wild. Wild. There are extra something of that nature. Any younger people are listening, I think it's a good idea uh, to go to museums to see what's going on and get very friendly with painting. Don't be a foreigner when you paint. Just get at home with painting because it uh, eventually helps you to develop. You might have talent at the beginning, but that talent must be developed. A lot of people don't realize that they think talent carries you all the way through the professional field, but it doesn't. It must be developed, and that means hard work. Uh, this concept of a painter being a little on the lazy side is not at all true. A good painter is a hard worker, and he is a continuous worker. So I learned that uh, by going to these museums and people. To this day, I use the museum, the paintings that were there, as a measure. I can see that the paintings uh, maybe may not be up to par, and I want to bring them up. And I've always kept that idea that I want to do one step better. Never sit back and say, I've reached it, and that's the best I can do. It's harder as you get more experience, but it's a good idea not to turn out pot boils. It's a good idea to give yourself uh, this idea of striving for the best that you can do. Now by doing that, then you will reach other goals than just a picture because the picture has a way of carrying you off into other areas. It lets you see other things because you study. I learned that first I began to learn that at the National Academy of Design. National Academy of Design teaches you to concentrate and to think very hard about what you're doing and if you can carry that idea in your paintings later on then painting becomes something else it's uh, I, I can give you an example of this thing turning into something else we paint it from the nude and as the light hit the figure you think you see a certain color but the longer you work on this painting maybe you're working a a couple of weeks on it, colors start to pop out. You start to see different shades of colors. 
And that's only because you're starting to really see. You're, you're studying. And you learn the difference between seeing and studying. So when you become an artist, you start to study. And that becomes good in painting later on when you paint. This idea of painting with concentration let something else come out, just like this sample, seeing different colors, later on you get different kinds of thoughts. I think Aristotle said there's a difference between uh, form and matter, and sometimes I paint, I don't do this purposely, but it comes out. For instance, this painting, it's sort of like the idea I just said, is it form or is it matter? And sometimes it says, the color grabs you and maybe wants it go toward form, and then again it says, I want matter. And this idea always is in my work, but I don't do it while painting consciously, it's just there naturally, right. you see. So sometimes when you paint, if you go to a gallery and see a painting, you have to get in tune with the artist, what he's trying to say. Don't judge the painting from your view, because most paintings are not going to be in your view, and you're going to disqualify it. So I think that uh, I think the thing to do, if you want to understand painting correctly, is to go to the painting and let the painting work on you. Now in painting, there are certain problems, and I am a lover of color. I love color. And sometimes I'll just sit down and analyze color from any view I can. Sometimes from a physical view, and sometimes it's psychological. But color has many meanings in different forms. Color can be very, very obvious, and then at times it can be very evasive. I love to explore it. Sometimes I see color psychologically, how does red affect someone? And if I think sometimes it's a mistake, and maybe not a mistake, for some women to wear red if they want to attract. Because red is so aggressive that it sort of lets people know what's on their mind. They are a little too obvious. I would say go to the oranges and yellows in a dress if you want to be aggressive, but it has more feminine and appealing way toward the male rather than being aggressive and uh, overbearing. I often think in my own work that um, art is a, a seductive skill. It is. To draw the viewer in. It is. And of course when you talk about a woman wearing a red dress and the power of that is you have to have a very strong personality not to be overwhelmed by the very color that you're wearing, and that's what you were speaking yeah, that's of. Right. You know, that's so the, the art of seduction is not yeah. pornography, it is the art of subtlety. Well, color does a lot of things. I had a friend who was a psychiatrist, and he said, I could tell you uh, an acquaintance we have when someone's walking toward us a hundred yards away. And he said, I can tell because each individual has characteristics that, even they are very subtle, he could tell through those characteristics, even not, without seeing detail of eyes oh, yeah. and so on. And that's what color does. Yes. Color sometimes is very, very aggressive. Now, if you, you see here, that would be a high chroma color. High chroma simply means it's a saturation of that color. Right. It's not the purity. Purity. It's purity. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you come up here and it gets smoky. Mm -hmm. But this purplish red is the same family as that. So you try to vary the temperament and see what happens in the canvas. Now, in here I use it as a very, you'll see it's very hot. It's almost like a furnace, the heat. You can feel, as you get in tune with color, it does something to you. Though you're not aware of it, it does work in the background. Here is a coal color. So often the artist uses a cold and warm color throughout his composition. Right. It, it makes the painting start to breathe and get exciting. Mm -hmm. You see, to clash. I think it was Van Gogh that said, 
blue is the brother of the sister orange. Right. And he put right. a um, female and male to it. Right. They, and Cezanne said that. Make sure your paintings have this this uh, opposite thing of cool right. and warm. Right. This is the what I refer to as the dichotomy of painting, that one thing is necessary to describe the other. Yeah. The warmth is warm because there's a cool adjacent to it. And yeah. so the cool describes the warm and the warm describes the, the cool. But yes, the, the complement or the opposite of blue is orange and those are the elements you have in your work. Yeah, I, in my teaching, I used to teach through principle where if you had the principle, then you didn't have to say, move this to the student or move that, and they wouldn't realize why oh, no. you would. But if you have the principle, that's what we're talking about, of warm and cool, then they understand that if they're painting, you have to solve a problem, and say we have all warm. You will instinctively, as a creative person, want to balance it or bring out the color by putting an opposite. And I put the blue. You can mm -hmm. see it's it's, right. it's it's needed here. We have problems. Maybe some people who are not too familiar with painting don't realize that each painting has to be solved. Each as you paint the picture, this the problems come up where you have to solve. For instance, if I use a purple and I look at it and I, I want to criticize my painting and say, how far can I go? Should I make a dark purple here? If I make a dark purple here, what will it do? And will it compete with this? So I felt I should leave the very strong colors here, but then if I put all strong colors over, it wouldn't have any contrast. So you'll get smoky colors come in lighter so they don't interfere with what you're doing. And that's how I balance the paintings. Here is another thing about paintings. I tried to have everything in the painting have meaning pictorially. For instance, we have a very large shape here. And then we have the fingers at the same shape. See. A mirror image. Yeah, a mirror image. Repeating of the image. And yeah. as you paint instinctively, mirror images come very, very naturally. I only can put it in words now trying to explain it. Right. But when you're painting, you, you don't have it all explained that way in words. It comes intuitively. Now that's the reason you should be a hard worker. Because through the years you gather so much knowledge and so much experience that it becomes almost as natural as breathing. Would you regard these as complementary shapes then, as they cool to warm or complementary to color? Are shapes complementary? Oh, oh yes, oh yes, yes. You, you can take a, a shape and, uh, for instance, let's take a, a very sort of loose uh, circular motion there, like that. But this is a strict, very strict confined. Yes, you can. Uh, you have to have a balance between things, and usually, to get back to the principal idea that I teach, I teach students watch out for opposites, because everything is made of opposites, and it's very difficult to give anyone uh, a chance to say there are no opposites. Day and night, yes and no black and white, and you go on and on and on, and it's endless. And you go out in the trees, and you can take any subject, the trees you do, there's endless, the roots go down, branches go up, you see. So I give my ch students a challenge and ask them to come up with some ideas. Now, if they do come up, it would be hard to get by, but a principle like that is what I call a universal principle. It can be used in poetry. It's used a lot in writing plays. You have to have the good guy, the bad guy, or uh, the very nice homey time, and then the disaster where something happens. 
that writers use this dramatically. And in painting the same thing, you've got to have some drama going on where these forms are going on all over the place, and all of a sudden you whack with a very hard-hitting uh, accented blue. That helps uh, the, the whole painting. So the painting is thought out very carefully. In this particular canvas, I am not interested in detail, but I'm interested in portraying just with shape. And each shape has to be good in itself, and each shape has to work. And that's where you have to struggle. Now, underneath this, there are other colors that got me to this. You don't always get it right off the bat. So what you see on the surface is many things underneath it that builds up to that conclusion. The, as you paint, problems are solved by the paint itself. It gives you hints, and if you're in tune with those hints, you'll solve these particular problems. And referencing um, works of uh, playwrights is that plays are structured for a beginning, a middle, and an end. Do you think in that form with a painting as well? Do you have a narrative quality that runs through your work so you have the sense in your own mind of where a painting begins, where yeah. the middle is, and where the conclusion? Uh, it's easier than it sounds because it's a very hard thing. You plan and you plan and you plan in your mind. And how I do it is I go to the subject and I make as many drawings as I can. And I think about that. And then I make many, many studies of that drawing and start to convert it into pictorial terms because nature is not pictorial in a sense. Where a lot of people think it isn't. So what they do is they lean on the subject, which is a mistake. The subject doesn't make the expression. Mm -hmm. It's what you do with artistic means that makes it a good painting. Right. So I eventually converted. And I'll show you what I do. I, I have a few sketches. And I'll make some preliminary ideas of what I want to do. And I thought I was going to use more of a blue uh, scheme in it. And here's what it ended up when I, I started up. I thought, I won't start blue. I'm going to have a very warm format and very high in key. Very high, high key, yes. High in key means it's very, very light, a lot of uh, sunshine feeling. It's not uh, dark like a black or a deep brown. And it's hard to do to make a painting with little contrast to work. So you can see, I show you this because your planning from beginning to end keeps changing and the possibility with colors is endless. First I thought I, I had to come up with some idea so I started with this cool. But when I just started to paint, instead of doing the blue at the spur of the moment, I started to work with warm colors. Just give you an idea um, how versatile color is and how far going it is. You can do many things with color. Indeed, and you can do them in different keys, just as you can play a song on a high note or a yeah. low note. Right. We often use in painting musical terms. And you have to come to some sort of conclusion in your mind how you're going to do it. Oh, so, yes. so to answer your question, I think what I do is I try to try, I'm using the word uh, strongly, because you can't always stay with it. I would advise anyone's painter to keep your mind on a big idea, some big idea that holds up because you're working, it has to hold it together because you're working with fragments all the time and you have to have something to keep it together and you're looking for order in your painting, you're looking for something that's going to hold on, uh, hold the painting together. So I would say that I keep something in mind and how I get that idea is through my work. I don't think, for me, I don't like to think it out all together. I like to actually work. That's my thinking, is actually draw, actually paint. I'd rather do the thing. And then when you're through with the painting, it's already accomplished what you were thinking. But if you go the other way and you think, you haven't accomplished that th idea. 
give you a good example how I learned that sort of thing. I learned it in many ways, but one was when I was at the Art Students Against a Student, there were students that went to the uh, cafeteria and sat and talked and talked and talked about art. And then there were other guys who were sitting there in the studio and painting all the time. And I found out there were the talkers and the doers. And these talkers had great theories, but when you looked at their work, it wasn't too good. You looked at these quiet guys who worked all the time, worked through the their paintings were better. So I, I would rather be a doer, and that's my way of thinking. You know, painting, to me, painting is a way of thinking. So when you look at a painting, you have a painting that has ideas. And that's what an artist does. If it's a good painting, a painting will take you um, way away from what you first started with. It's an uncovering, it's an uncovering of truths. And that's how I do it. I uh, work the painting out through actual work. That's why I have hundreds and hundreds of studies, and I go to them and let them help me get to different stages to develop the painting till it's finished. Great, great. Greg, how are we doing? Uh, well, we have battery left. Do we have time? Yes, we do. I'm just, do you still have battery? Yes. Okay, well, we can proceed then and cut out this little uh, technical stuff later. All right, um, coming back. Ralph, um, does serendipity play a role in your work? I mean, you have everything pretty much worked out. You do a lot of technical sketches. You do some small concept pieces, I believe. And then when you get into the major work, uh, do you find that the happy accident occurs and you have the wisdom to accept no. it? or? Yeah, that takes a little time uh, when you're a painter. When you're a student, you're overwhelmed. There, there are a, a lot of things you have to learn to be a painter. Um, uh, you ha have one of them is what you just brought up. You have to r understand or recognize a happy note. I've covered some paintings that were gems because I didn't understand what was happening. And you, sometimes what happens is you paint constantly. And as you paint, all of a sudden, your painting runs into an area that you haven't been. And you don't recognize there's a future coming up with that. Mm -hmm. It's telling you, you might be going, for instance, I used to paint in the 60s when I showed with the Babcock Gallery in, the in gray tones. And I didn't know I was a colorist. I had talent for color. But eventually it came to me that I should be using more color but the painting says occasionally it would be one that would be good color and the rest would be in grays yes it does happen where accidents happen you've got to recognize what does that accident mean should I tear the painting up or should I keep it I keep that painting now and I store it and I found that if you look at it later on, maybe 10 years or 5 years later, the answer is there. It says you're going in this direction. But sometimes you're not right. Recognition is hard. It, these things sound so simple. But it's hard to recognize while you're in the act of painting what is good and, and what is not. Most of the time you're on target, but things sneak in uh, that are elusive and you're not quite sure uh, if it, it's good enough. But learn some of your good things that you do. Don't criticize yourself to the point that everything is bad. Uh, sometimes enjoy that goodness, you know, and uh, thank God you can hit on some things. Sometimes, most of the uh, painting I do is well thought out and, and I, I want a consciousness of what I'm doing. But when you paint steadily and in a natural way, things are going to sneak in. You may have had an experience with color or some experience, and that experience wants out because you're an expressor. You're a creative expressor. So if I've gone, let's say, uh, I haven't done this, but just for an, uh, explaining an experience. Suppose they invited me to go to outer space, and I went out of outer space. I'm sure that would creep into my painting some way, <laughs> because that would be quite an experience. I would think so. Yeah. I would think so. Yeah. Well, we're going we're, we're gonna to keep you here for the time being. <laughs> but if the opportunity comes up, I'll let you oh, know. Okay. <laughs>
I used to work with a NASA artist, uh, the late Attila Hedja, and uh, he never lived long enough to make a space journey, but I know any artist who's been in that program would, are there, really got their fingers crossed to be a part of that. You want to take a break? Or you yeah, let's take on? a break. I just want to see how we're doing with time, so I guess okay, we'll we're, we're, we're back. We're back. And so here is the uh, question I wanted to start with is um, the influences when you were a young student, uh, were there teachers that you studied with at National Academy of Design or Art yeah. Students League who stay in your mind? Well, when I first started, um, there, were, there were painters, uh, but they were not teachers. They were professional painters. Some uh, worked in a professional field as commercial artists, but they knew about drawing and painting. and they. Uh, took a liking to my paint drawings and they knew what I needed to, if I wanted to pursue it. And big thing that came up all the time was go to art school. I didn't get to art school right away, but I did a few things. I went to uh, New York City to commercial galleries just to get ideas, and I approached them very directly uh, about this my problem. I said, I'm painting, I had a small portfolio, and I, I asked them, what do you think I should do? I said, I'm not looking for a job, but I'm at this particular juncture and development in my work. I want some advice. And I, I got some good advice some, from them. Most of it turned out to be the same. Get yourself to an art school. That's what most of the people told me. And I kept hearing that. So that was always in the back of my mind. So after I served in the Army, I had the GI Bill in my favor, and I took advantage of it. And I did get my training. I went to the, the Art Students League and also the uh, well, the National Academy really came before the war, and I had some realistic training there. And after the war, I wanted to continue my training, and I went to the uh, uh, Art Students League. So that's the beginning of really... At the League, did you have any teachers that stood out in your mind? Yeah, there was uh, one teacher, Will Barnett, who I give credit for... Uh, structuring my canvas. Mm -hmm. Each teacher seemed to have a pet direction he wanted to go. And I had very little training in composition. And Will Burnett uh, started to teach me that it's pictorial means that help to express things in a painting rather than the subject matter. And he was very interested in the underlying structure of a painting. And of course, on my off hours, I would then go to museums and see things that I didn't see when I was a youngster when I visited the museums. I started to see the underlying structure they had. And many of the old masters had that underlying structure. I think Cezanne wanted to hold on to that, though he felt the Impressionists were going in a new way of working. He felt they were not structured enough. So Cezanne structured his work in fashion uh, uh, like the uh, old masters. And that has stayed with me till this day. Uh, I, I see things in a structured way. I even don't draw literally anymore. I structure the canvas from the beginning because I know, I know that that's what has to be done anyway. And I get a, a, a leg up on it. Many um, historians credit uh, Cezanne as the father of Cubism, and uh, when you talk about structure, it is the, um, the third dimension, the, the, the form that dominates in Cezanne's work, the construction of structure uh, to give sense of depth and difference of, of angles. Was that what was influencing you at that time? Well. There were a lot of things really influenced me, but uh, you asked about the teacher, and that was Will Barnett, Barnett that yeah. got me into that. And Barnett was, a, uh, as I remember, a lot of his work was uh, very much a minimal approach 
yeah. in painting. And I can remember uh, a canvas, a white canvas with a dark vertical line down the center. He, broad, loved, broad he loved the vertical and the horizontal stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the time, too, that I studied uh, in the 50s, there was a different atmosphere in the arts than there is now. What permeated the uh, whole feeling in the art world was uh, dynamic sensation, a sense of uh, we're on to something of discovery. Right. It was a real uh, improvisational mood and a creative mood. You know, it's an interesting point you bring up because we had that after the First World War, too, and I wondered how much of the world in turmoil, because the, the world was changed enormously by the Second World War as it was with the First World War. I, I, think, I, think, there, oh, I think there was a tremendous influence. And your generation had... Oh, they, they had it. Uh, yeah. Where There were some horrible things we saw on the wall, like charred, burnt bodies. Yeah. And it was a, a common thing that everybody knows about the horrors of war. And there were artists coming out with images that were ugly. And the public didn't realize they were talking about the ugliness of war. Yeah. And they would say, and the artists think it's this thing negative. But the artist was trying to report, hey, this is what the world was during the war. It, it also it, seemed like the generation was willing to take risks with art because it was insignificant to the risk that you took with your life during the war. It was a much more experimental time. Yeah, there's, even today, uh, there's a feeling in the contemporary world that the average person is willing to take risks than they were years ago. In the 19th century, there was more of a staid idea of what standards were, and they, people adhered to the standards. Today, they're up for grabs of what is the standard, or we don't want a standard. We want to keep the freedom open yes, to course. explore, and with that freedom, we have an opportunity to go further. This is part of the modern movement. Uh, one of the points of the modern movement is to free the artist from dogma. And, the, and that's why you have diversified painting today and sculptor is because the artist can think in his own way and come up with his own thoughts rather than conforming to a set of rules they had in the 19th century. I've always felt that being an artist is an exploration of human potential, your own, because you're yeah. practicing it. Yeah. But I think you can never set a limit to say that this is as far as art can go because then you're setting the limit as to how far the human soul can go. And yeah. this is an exploration of that territory. When th I, these are just the tools. And I, I would add to that, that art is a, f a vehicle for the artist to go in that direction, to go beyond the ordinary. Exactly. To find new aspects that you weren't aware of. If you look at a painting as a viewer, you will find in a good painting things that you never thought of, that you've been looking at for years, but you now see him through the artist's eyes, and he picked up different things. For it, the idea I gave you while I was a student painting the nude, these different colors would you would discover, they would come to you and let you find them, because you studied. Yeah. Well, the average person doesn't study, they look. And the artist then presents you with yes. new findings of yes. things. So this is what uh, the art is. Uh, we don't just paint pretty pictures. If you are a true artist, you're looking for discoveries, for yes. truths, yes. if you want truths. This is the best way to be a good painter is be truthful. This is one thing that uh, the student must understand is that they think they can see. And they really can't because they think that looking is seeing because seeing is comprehension. Right. And the more that you work with color, the more your brain takes in. And colors literally change. Yeah. When you go out into nature, as I've done, uh, things that were not apparent a few years before become more apparent because yeah. the brain is learning to see. Right. Now, it's a muscle that it gets exercised. Well, in education, we often have uh, the problem, should we teach art or should we have the, just the classic uh, study history and math and so on. And they don't think it's an education, but art is an education. Yes. Art teaches you many things. You go into philosophy and find out 
how people think of philosophy. Look at the influence they had on surrealist, the dreams that people uh, got that from Freud to go into oh, dreams, absolutely. so that you can go into any avenue and f any discipline. Mathematics comes in with Mondrian and many of the mm -hmm. other painters. Mm -hmm. So art is a way of learning. You, as you and I, I learned almost everything through curiosity, because of the art teaches you to go and yeah. do things. My first advice I was uh, that was given to me when I was a teenager. Draw everything and anything. And that then led on to start to study things and get interested in these things because they have worlds to take you that you never realized existed. So, art, you study a good Rembrandt and it has umpteen to tell you about the soul of man, but you have to know how to read it. If you don't know how to read it, you're lost. If you can read, paintings, and you have to learn how to read paintings. It's just like poetry or anything else, you have to learn to read it, just like you're learning to read a book. It will reveal to you things that you would be amazed at, and then the light will light in your brain and say, I have a new concept, and it can change you through that concept, because we live in concepts, and people have, these concepts lead you on. In today's concepts, we are a little lost as spectators with art. We don't understand too much of the aesthetic world and the spirit world that's in the art form. We understand the pragmatic system now, how much are you making, this kind of thing. And we are, are shortchanging ourselves. Those of us who have a talent turn the talent away because it's not practical. And they shortchange themselves because they're giving a, a a hint that you have a direction to follow as a being, it's why you put here, but they don't do it and they refuse it. We have a very large direction in this society we have today of non-appreciation of aesthetics and working through the arts as an insight. They see arts as a decorative thing, something that is miscellaneous from life, but it's connected with life itself. We do, we do see far too much of that because um, art galleries are strewn with paintings that are merely picturesque. Right. And we strive for something beyond right. the picture, the transcendent, that right. will take the viewer to another place, that the painting is the starting point. Yes. I, regard, I regard really great painting as unfinished, so that it presents a dialogue for the viewer. Absolutely. It, it, an artist can be very frustrated if he doesn't have a pulp to follow his work because he knows just what you said. It, 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 he's painting it for it to go on and that going on then it, it makes you feel that it's worthwhile. I had a, a very nice letter from a, a person who lived down south and she bought a painting of mine years ago. She wrote a letter and she said, happiness is owning a Delavope painting. Well, that meant to me it's working on the person. Absolutely. Whether it makes them happy or whether they can. And then I received another letter, and she said, I got this letter, a painting of yours, uh, done at the, uh, sold through the Babcock Gallery. And the, the painting gives me a great deal of delight, but I keep, it keeps me wondering. Uh, the next step of what's really in it because I see things but they suggest other things and it makes me think well that's a, doesn't that throw that's you? great Isn't that great? that's great yeah. because you're not painting for yourself you're yeah. really painting two things you're painting for somebody else and you're painting to get out of yourself for a betterness that's in you a more talented thing that's in within you it's only giving you a talent at the beginning to get you started but if you develop it it's a means for you as a human being, as a tool to get at deeper things and meanings. You know, you remind me of an artist I approached uh, recently to come and do an outdoor show. And the outdoor shows uh, that we see all around the country during from spring to fall for the most part uh, are were places for people to begin. And it is so important that um, this act, which is so much a reclusive act, must have 
some kind of um, vindication, some, some kind of connection to the public. I mean, we, we speak not to an empty room, but we speak to an ear to, be, to hear us. Yes, yes. And that's why it is so critical for young painters not to be afraid to put their work out there, because the biggest thing that stops you is the feeling, I don't know how to paint yet. I've been painting for 52 years, and I'm still learning how to paint. That, if the, the moment that feeling goes away, that you know what you're doing, I tell my students, take piano lessons. But everybody else, get your work out there as soon as you can, yeah. because the feedback will surprise you. It will surprise you in a good way. Well, join a club, because I'm still learning. Yeah, I'm still learning. Isn't and that I, wonderful? And I want to learn. I, I want to learn. I want. It keeps you alive. It keeps gives you meaning. Yeah, you know. And you know, there's nothing worse than getting stayed and doing something over and over oh, and yeah. repeating it. But we see that all the time, don't we? Oh, in all society, that. we have an. It's, all, all it's accepted that you get take a job you don't like. Yeah, it's all. accepted where you do things yeah. uh, in a mundane, productive way where it, it just doesn't have any spiritual meaning or uplifting. Yeah. But if you can get in, I would advise young artists really to get interested and go deep with it. Don't do it superficially because there's rewards. There's a lot of disappointments. And when you have this feeling that you're going someplace with it that goes beyond the mundane, it, lets you, it carries you through the hardships. It, some people wonder, what are you doing, uh, not, maybe not selling a painting or making big, big money, which is an aim today. Uh, they want big, big money seal. Everybody wants to know how much you're making. But there are other things that keep you uh, to what you're doing. And I think that I would rather have somebody interested and happy rather than doing something they want and bored. Now, that's a hard thing to accept. Because each of us has to go through life on our own, and we have to, we make choices. We have to make choices. But if I can make a, my viewpoint, that would be it. I've gone down that road. I've been told from, a, oh, maybe when I was 12 years old, from on, then on, that it's going to be a tough road. I've heard it from my family, I heard it from other artists, that it's, it's a tough road to go down to be an artist. But there's got to be something that keeps you with it, that goes beyond the average. Now, you, you taught for over 30 years, yeah. and uh, Greg and I were talking about this earlier. And, of course, when, you, when you're teaching, that takes you away from your work. Um, were you motivated to teach because it provided some kind of security for your family? Yeah, um, well, when um, I was going to leave the Art Students League, I met with some instructors and with some other artists, art students. And the agenda was, what do we do now that we're getting out of school? Because our teaching days were over. Um, we, we had some teachers who were very gracious. And the upshot of what they said was, get yourself a job. You need it to develop. Right. Because you've learned things, now you have to develop it. Mm -hmm. And this is how I got into teaching. I had been doing teaching on the side um, with other students. Uh, and I found that it was sort of a natural thing. We had a, um, an artist who uh, had a heart attack, and he called me in to teach in his studio, because he said his students were getting uh, annoyed and also frustrated that there was no instruction. Uh, so I volunteered to go in and, and give some criticism. And he had great feedback that I did very well. So I then found out I had a natural instinct for teaching. And my wife and I um, typed up uh, 600 applications and sent them out. And one was an application uh, for a job, uh, and they came to interview me, and. When it came time for them to speak, they heard what I could do. They told us what the aim was, and they said that they couldn't get anybody interested in their art department. They wanted to build the art department, and if they built, had a person there who was an, an artist in resident who worked in campus and lived on campus, um, if we, we could take an interest in it and build a department. And I did, and we did build a department, 
and they gave me some time to paint. The job was, get this, $1,800 a year. That was my first salary. I asked my wife, do you think we can do it? She was very game, she always has been game, and she said, sure we do it. And we did it. Now we did have things that we had to rent, was free, and we could eat at the cafeteria at school, which we did not do. There was some of those things. But it was, it was not easy. Then I took on uh, odd jobs, different jobs. I had a professional uh, painting job with painters. Mm -hmm. and I had an interesting experience there talking about uh, how the artist works. And anybody, this is anybody can do this. We all, as human beings, have it. I, I was with this painting crew, and we were painting this room, and I knew I could paint houses as well as they. And I went to the boss and asked him for a raise, because I had, you know, a family. And he turned me down, and I was angry. And I came back, I didn't say a word, and I painted. And my partner said to me, you want to talk about something? He said, you are mad. I didn't say a word, but he could tell the way I was doing the brush. Oh, really? I was that man. Just on the brush I was, was taking it out on the brush. <laughs> well, that, well, that does that with a paint boy. Now, paint the paints. You can see the brush strokes and how he felt. And that's a good reading. Yeah, yeah. But now, in a photograph, you'll lose that. So I would say if anybody wants to really know about art, go to the original because it has the handprint of the artist, the feeling of the oh, brush, and how he feels about it. Well, just also if you love color because reproductions never do it. They never, 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 never do, do it. it. And they, they speak to you uh, loud and clear and more truthfully. Yeah. Today, another thing we have, which is a very common thing, is we use photographs constantly in our way of living, mm -hmm. in magazines, movies, photographs, and we see things secondhand. We do a lot of things that we don't, we didn't do uh, in centuries back. We do things secondhand. Yeah. We we are a secondhand nation. We let we, we let the phone do it for us. We let television do it for us. We let everything do do it by mechanical means. We're living by virtual reality. Right. You got it. <laughs> You got it. Well, listen, I think on that note, at least for this interview, and I hope there'll be more because I've really enjoyed talking with you, Ralph. I hope. So, yeah, I, I've enjoyed this. Well, so far, so good then. Yeah. All right, well, let's um, make it a wrap up for today. I'm Bill Merkline, and you're not. Uh, Chevy Chase won. And I thank you for um, your attention with this. Thank you.